Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Susanna and Charlotte. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, Jen, for that intro and we love hearing the poll results. Um, thanks everyone for being here. My name is Charlotte and Suzanne will be also helping present today. And thank you to Sloat as always for having us. I also will shout out the um, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission for and the Marin, Suzanne, you might have taught me with us, the Marin County Stormwater Pollution Prevention Program and the Contra Costa Clean Water Program as well for sponsoring this program. Today, we're going to talk about roses. And I just wanted to share, as Jen just said, there will be a rose pruning class on Saturday. So what we're gonna talk today about is rose care in general and um, focus on pest prevention and growing healthy roses and less about the specific pruning techniques. So um, if you have questions about that, I recommend attending the Saturday program. So we're gonna go for, through slides for about 45 minutes and we'll answer your questions at the end. Please use the Q&A um, tool to enter your questions in. Uh, what we're gonna learn today, I will introduce that 70 so percent of you to the Our Water Our World program. We're going to talk a little bit about integrated pest management, which is what we um, like to talk about at Our Water Our World focusing on pest prevention for roses, and we'll discuss common pests of roses and man management strategies, and we'll always provide you some additional resources in this webinar, and there have been some uh, emailed to you, I believe, as well. So what is Our Water, Our World? Uh, Our Water, Our World is a um, award-winning program that um, partners with retailers like hardware stores, um, garden centers, nurseries, um, and we uh, provide pest problem solving education and we bring awareness between pesticides and water quality. So this in the stores that we partner with, uh, which we partner with about 200 stores in the greater Bay Area um, and a little bit beyond that as well. Uh, what you'll see in most stores is a rack like the photo on the left uh, with fact sheet information sheets um, available to uh, the customers, uh, free to take um, about very useful information, common um, pests and you know how to grow healthy roses and beautiful lawns, things like that. Then also we'll have blue tags like the one in the top right that highlight the eco-friendly products on the shelf. And then in some stores, you also may see posters that have QR codes where you can scan with your smartphone and then get those fact sheet information, that fact sheet information directly on your phone. Uh, we also have the Our Water Our World website that, bring, that has all of those fact sheets um, and information on water quality as well. So what we like to talk about at Our Water Our World is water quality um, and keeping pesticides out of waterways. So the drains um, that you see on your street or in loading docks, parking lots, those drain directly to, in most counties, I will say, most counties, they drain directly to a waterway, creek, stream, uh, bay, ocean. Um, so everything, we just wanna make, bring the awareness that everything we're doing out in the yard, uh, with our cars, with our pets, in our garden, um, has a direct line to waterways. So, and that's not just pesticides and fertilizers, that's also pet waste, motor oil, um, debris, uh, paper masks, things like that. It's a direct line to uh, local waterways. So we wanna reduce the amount of pollution that we um, send that way. And how we can do this is by implementing integrated pest management. Um, and it's kind of a scary name, but it's a, it's a it's not a very scary um, idea. <laughs> so integrated pest management is, um, it's a decision-making process mostly, and it uses science-based strategies. Um, we really wanna take a step, we take a step back, we look at the garden in this case as a whole. Um, so we're, you, we're using a holistic view and we're asking a lot of questions. Uh, really the big question is what is the problem? Because a lot of times we might see a problem with a plant, but um, 
that kind of symptom can be caused by a lot of different things. So, you know, yellowing leaves can be a pest or a fungus, but it also can be a nutrient deficiency or watering issue um, or some other issues. So we want to really get to the root of the problem. Um, and then we also can ask ourselves, can we live with it? Everyone has different tolerances. Sometimes pests are, you know, short-lived. They don't cause a lot of damage. Maybe we can just ignore them, or sometimes they do cause a lot of damage. We do have to take action steps. We focus a lot on prevention. Prevention is always the first step in integrated pest management. Um, we'll discuss a lot of preventative measures today for your healthy roses. Identification, again, we do need to identify the real, the problem at hand. And if it is a pest, we need to identify what pest it is because that will allow us to take the best action steps to get rid of it. So if we do decide we want to get rid of the pest or whatever is causing the problem, we're going to take some action steps and they're called controls in integrated pest management. There's cultural controls, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about today. It's really bolstering the health of the garden. It's creating a good environment for your plants and a less good environment for pests. There's also mechanical controls, traps, barriers, and tools, physical things that we can use in the garden to reduce pest problems or uh, prevent pest problems even. Biological controls, which is really supporting the ecosystem of the garden. So understanding that there's lots of organisms out there, insects, birds, mammals, um, amphibians that can help balance out the ecosystem and that will help to reduce pest problems. And we want to encourage that. Um, and then last but not, or last and least is chemical controls, which are pesticides. We're always using them as a last resort if we decide to use them. So that is also a choice not to use them. Um, and we're going to use it only after we've tried all these other options. And we are going to go for the most eco-friendly as possible, least toxic option, and very sparingly. So first we'll talk about pest prevention for roses. And what does this look like? Um, it, how, it looks like focusing on the soil, building healthy soil and protecting those root zones with mulch and developing them with organic fertilizers and proper watering. All of these things will go into a healthy root zone and healthy soil. Also choosing plant disease resistant, or sorry, <laughs> disease resistant roses um, will also be a great preventative measure to reduce diseases and just general healthy garden practices and inviting in those beneficial insects. So first we'll start with the soil. If you have healthy soil, you'll have healthy roses and that will automatically lead to pest, less pest problems. Healthier plants are less attractive to pests and if they, there are pests that do arrive, they're going to be more able to fight off pest infestations. And ways we can build healthy soil. Uh, one very easy way is to add compost. Compost is uh, decomposed organic matter. Um, we want to increase the organic matter levels in our soil. Adding compost to soil will increase water retention. Um, so it'll help hold on to water. It really turns your soil into a sponge. So it'll help hold on to water longer. Um, compost can hold five times its weight in water and it will hold on to it more of it and longer so that your roses will have access to water for longer periods of time. Compost is also, it is organic matter. So it's full of nutrients and bacteria and fungi. They're all going to work into your soil to um, supply nutrients to your root, your plant roots um, sustainably and for a long period of time. Compost can also, as when it's added to soil, it also improves the soil structure, makes the soil um, a better texture or not texture, structure for your plants to be able to grow and access nutrients and water um, for longer periods of time. Another way to protect the soil um, and to build healthy soil is to use mulch. So um, then when we're talking about using mulch for healthy soil, we're talking about using organic mulches. So that's bark, wood chips, straw, 
uh, leaves, grass clippings, um, that all of those organic materials can be used as a nice protective layer. So it'll help, mulch will help water infiltrate uh, your soil easier. It also is that protective layer, so there will be less evaporation. It will keep that soil cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. It regulates soil temperatures. And as it breaks down, it also adds nutrients to the soil. It is important when you're dealing with any plants, but especially roses or any plants, including roses, uh, we do want to make sure we're keeping mulch away from the stem or the crown of the plant. That's where the above ground and below ground um, parts meet. We want to keep that mulch away from that area, um, push it out a few inches or six to 12 inches, depending on the type, the size of the plant. We don't want to crowd that area because that can invite more moisture and invite fungal diseases. All right, we've already received a few great questions that we will be uh, covering throughout the program. So I haven't replied yet. Uh, one question that came up though is in regards to restoring an older rose, pay attention to this section. This section is really one of the most important parts of our program, if you ask me. I've taken care of a lot of roses in my time as a professional gardener, and this is everything I've learned firsthand. So in addition to building that beautiful soil uh, with the compost and uh, protecting the soil with mulch, we want to feed with organic fertilizers. Uh, I spend a lot of money on organic fertilizer and uh, spend a lot of time feeding my roses. And as a result, uh, either for my clients or for myself, the roses really uh, respond well to this. So we're going to choose organic rose fertilizers. And the main reason is um, with the, all that beautiful microbiology that we've added to the soil with compost, we want to feed it and we want to continue to increase that beautiful symbiotic relationship between the microbes and the root systems of the roses. And we're going to do that by feeding with organic fertilizers. We also uh, want to understand that when we feed with organic fertilizers, we're providing food to the plants and to the, to the health of the soil on an as need basis. So this means that with the help of the microbiology, the roses can now absorb and access the nutrients when it needs it. Okay, when we apply synthetic fertilizers, what happens is that uh, it stimulates a lot of new growth. It acts like as a steroid. And what likes that new growth? But insects. We'll see a lot more insects when we are feeding with synthetic fertilizers. Um, and then I can also share that organic fertilizers, uh, we do not risk burning our plants or polluting our local waterways. I will share that roses love alfalfa meal. So I, it, it supercharges your roses. It adds nitrogen and trace minerals to the soil. It improves the tilt of the soil. And it also contains this natural fatty acid growth stimulant called trianotol. I'm not exactly sure how to say it, but my point is, is that, um, there's been articles in the past. I know there was a New York Times article, the uh, a love affair between roses and alfalfa meal. I know some people will choose to use the alfalfa pellets that maybe they get at a feed store. I will just strictly work with or alfalfa, alfalfa meal because I'm never sure what they're binding that material with. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's natural because if you're going to feed it to livestock or rabbits, but also, I want the microbiology to be able to absorb and process this uh, alfalfa meal even more quickly. I will, um, though my organic fertilizer that I've purchased, such as you know one of these brands will contain alfalfa meal, I am adding equal parts of alfalfa meal to my organic, one-to-one -one, uh, organic rose fertilizer and alfalfa meal. Next. As a mite. So this is one of those quirky uh, fertilizers that we see on the shelf. 
And let me share that this is a really important one for you. Um, it is natural. It contains no fillers or additives. It does not restrict water penetration or uh, um, aeration, um, though that's what some people seem to think. But it provides additional nit uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. But what it really does is that it gives your plants, uh, the root systems, and the stems a little bit more vigor and more uh, buds, so higher yields of flowers. But for some of our roses, I do have a few uh, David Austins where the head of the rose is too heavy and they have a tendency to droop and open up like this. When I add azomite, it really helps with that vigor, keeping the stem really strong and stiff so that I can have beautiful upright uh, English roses. So. This is why I want to share this with you because it is uh, key to having um, gorgeous roses that we can cut and bring in and enjoy. Another really important part of my fertilizing practice is adding earthworm castings. Earthworm castings are a superfood. So again, I am adding my organic fertilizer, my alfalfa meal. I'm going to add a little azomite according to the label's instructions. It's usually uh, a few tablespoons as well as earthworm castings. And I'm going to work it into the soil around that root zone of my roses. I do want it to be inside the soil. I don't want it to be just on top, but I will share that, um, uh, the earthworm castings uh, contain important enzymes and uh, beneficial bacteria that will um, work through the cell structure of the plants to provide highly effective um, uh, pest inhibitors. So it's going to prevent a lot of pests and diseases. So that's another reason why I really love the earthworm castings. So. If you got nothing out of this program, please, that should be your biggest takeaway. And then through the growing season, so I apply and all of those fertilizers uh, now. So uh, my roses, we're, we've been warm. We're starting to see roses break dormancy a little bit, but normally it's still cold. Normally the roses are still dormant. So I did prune my roses last weekend. You're gonna learn how to prune roses this coming weekend uh, by our wonderful expert. Uh, at the time of pruning is when I do my fertilizing, just so I can, cause I'm giving them a lot of attention. However, it's not too late if you haven't fertilized yet. And if you are starting to see those roses break dormancy, that's okay, you're not too late. Through the growing season, which is typically, I'll say April through September, I am also adding liquid fertilizer. I am, um, I am watering in a liquid fertilizer uh, twice a month, okay? You can go get away with once a month, that's fine. Um, sometimes I forget, it's only once a month, but then, you know, if I'm doing it twice a month, it's even better. And this is just going to provide even more food for our roses because I really want glossy green leaves and beautiful uh, full heads of flowers. And this is going to give me blooms for a long time. And then here's just an illustration of when we're working with organic fertilizers, we see that it's actually feeding that uh, uh, microbiology, those microorganisms in the soil, and then it's having that beautiful symbiotic relationship with the root zone. Whereas if we're feeding with chemical synthetic fertilizers, we're only feeding the plant. I apologize, um, something's happening with my advancing. So uh, we're only feeding the plant. And if we happen to miss uh, a scheduled feeding, then that plant becomes stressed. I'll also share that synthetic fertilizers are very high in salts. And if we are not watering deeply, we are going to have a buildup of salt in the top couple inches of our soil, which can be quite detrimental to our plants. All right, now it's Charlotte's turn. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, and then more things to consider, especially when you're putting in your roses. I know some of you are now shopping for your roses and planting them now, which is a great time to do it. Uh, when you're choosing your roses, you do want to be very aware of where you're putting them. 
um, uh, in your yard and the roses that you choose. We always say right plant, right place. You wanna make sure that that rose you're putting in your yard is going to be suited for that portion of the yard. There are microclimates even within your own yard. So really keep that in mind. There's the sunny areas, there's the shady areas, there's the hills, there's the low moist points. Um, so uh, when you're reading those labels, understand that full sun is six or more hours of direct sunlight. Part sun or part shade is three to six hours of direct sun. Uh, morning preferred because it's sun is less strong in the morning. Dappled sun would be filtered sunlight all day. And then shade is no direct sunlight. And then more to keep in mind um, when you, both when you're planting and when you're maintaining your established roses, uh, we're going to water to encourage deep roots when we have our brand new roses in the ground. Um, so they start out smaller, but we really want the root zone to develop nice and uh, deep and out. So ro roots go where the water goes. So we really wanna encourage that water when we're watering, we're not watering directly right at the crown or at the stem. We're gonna water around the drip line, which we'll cover on the next slide. So that's um, to saturate the entire root zone and even just a little bit beyond the root zone so that it encourages those roots to go further out and down. And we once, uh, new roses will need more uh, water than established roses. So keep that in mind. We do want to, even if they're low water plants, we do want to give them more water when they're getting established. And um, different types of plants take different um, times to get established. Um, shrubs can take two to three years to be established. Uh, so um, we want to keep that in mind when we're watering. And we're going to, uh, once they are more established, we're going to remember to water deeply. So we really still want that um, thorough watering of the root zone. And, but we're going to do it less frequently. We're going to let the soil surface dry out a few inches between watering. So we're not completely saturating that root zone all the time. And really quick, Charlotte, yeah. uh, someone asked if they should be, since we haven't had any rain and it is very dry, should we be watering our dormant roses? When the roses are dormant, um, we do not need to water them necessarily. However, once they start to break dormancy, when we start to see little buds uh, push at those nodes, that's when we want to start watering again. However, we want to be very careful, as Charlotte said, we want to let the top few inches dry out on our established roses. And just today, the top of my roses looked really dry because I've got a nice thick layer of mulch. I was about to go water them, but I stuck my finger in and I noticed about three inches down, they're still really moist because the air is still cool. The wind is cool, the air is cool, the top is starting to dry out, but they did not need more water. So I'm waiting a couple more days. So I just wanted to add that. Please keep adding your, for, I don't have roses. I don't really care for roses. Like I don't have my own. So I'm like your, your personal experiences are always most helpful. Um, and then we're gonna focus uh, the water, as I mentioned at the drip line, that is the edge of the canopy um, of your roses or your tree or whatever plant it is. So we really wanna encourage the water to outwards, not focusing at the crown out and around um, at that drip line again to encourage those um, that root zone to expand and go out and down. And this is a very common mistake. A photo of a landscaping person might have put in some irrigation when they put in this um, tree or shrub. Um, the emitter is right at the crown of the plant. You can see even the water line in there. Um, or where the soil was, the soil or the mulch was right up against that crown. And in this picture, it was cleared away. And the emitter is right at that crown. This is not gonna be helpful for the root zone and it could invite fungal diseases. So we, we have to also remember as our plant grows, we're gonna expand that drip line. I mean that, sorry, well, the drip irrigation line <laughs> to, uh, grow with the drip line of the trees. So as your plant grows, expand out that uh, irrigation area. 
I can't tell you how many times I've seen this on roses where the irrigation was just set up straight away and uh, you know years these established roses are years old and then I'm coming in as a you know to work on this property and I have to move all these emitters out as far as as possible. I was just thinking the same thing. I was going to say literally I I do 3 to 4 consultations a week and I would say almost 100% uh, this is like what we see in the garden and this is it's good for you to know because I think a lot of homeowners don't don't know to look for this, but this is pretty critical information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was an installation that one of uh, one of our guests that was on a program, uh, she had a gardener install these uh, plants for her and this irrigation. And she sent me this picture. She's like, oh, this is what you were talking about. Sh should I move it? And I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. So just know that this is very common and that's why we're bringing it up. And by the way, Charlotte, Jen and I didn't used to like roses, but now we both really love roses. So you're going to learn to love them. Totally. Oh, I know. I realized I phrased <laughs> that in that I don't care for them as in I don't like them. But what I meant was I don't have any of my own that I care for. <laughs> I like roses. I live near the rose garden and I, I yeah. <laughs> Nice save. Nice save. <laughs> yeah. I know. I said that. I was like, that's wrong. <laughs> so we, um, yeah, you learn to love them. We all have our favorites. And uh, I can share that um, all the roses that are featured today are roses, photos I've taken myself and roses that I have. So we want to choose disease resistant varieties to save us that pain of dealing with all of the black spot and the rust. However, there is a number of roses that I have that are not disease resistant and I love them, but I know to expect. So like my David Austin is always going to get covered with uh, black spot and rust, but I, I'm, I'm tolerant of it. And we're going to talk about some diseases in a little bit, but just know that there are so many beautiful disease resistant varieties. And when we are working with our roses, it's really important to clean up the garden clean up the garden and we're going to deadhead our roses to encourage more blooms. We're going to remove any dead or damaged branches that might occur from winds and so forth. We're definitely going to remove diseased leaves. And I will share that when I, uh, with my David Austin that is prone to get black spot and rust, I'm defoliating the bottom third. I'm removing the leaves from the bottom third just to give it more air circulation. And when I do prune it, I'm making sure I'm really opening it up so there's a lot of airflow. So these are some tricks I've learned to help uh, my roses look even more beautiful. And then, um, and then yeah, of course, we're always going to uh, just monitor for pest problems. So all of those we've discussed have been prevention and cultural controls, really bolstering the health of the garden uh, before we even have pests um, arriving, uh, which will automatically prevent pests. So then we can also use mechanical controls to prevent pests for um, our roses. And a lot of, and so this includes barriers. And so this could be deer fencing, which needs to be at least seven feet tall, gopher baskets, uh, any new planting should go in a gopher basket. Whether you have gophers or not in the Bay Area, they're everywhere. So if you don't have them yet, you likely will. Um, and it's gonna save you a headache if you put your plants in gopher baskets as you plant them. Shade cloth is also a great way to protect your plants from the heat of the sun in the summer. And then other barriers like copper tape barrier can keep slugs and snails away as well. And there's lots of other barriers as well, exclusion cages, bird netting, things like that. Traps are also a mechanical or physical control. Um, there's on the top right, there's snail or slug board traps, which just uh, catch the snails and slugs in the heat of the day, and then you can scrape them off. There's white fly traps, gopher traps, rat traps, and then earwig traps is a self or a designed trap by Suzanne, who's going to tell her, tell you how it worked for her. So last year, earwigs were, they were having a great year. I've never had so many earwigs in my garden. So uh, one tip I learned on the UC IPM website, because we always go there to learn, uh, was to make an earwig trap. 
Now I'm not a fan of the rolled newspaper with the earwig. It's just, that's too much of a hassle for me. But I learned if you take a deli container and then you put some holes, I cut some holes on the top, not very pretty, but I cut some holes, not very big, about the size of a pencil, diameter of a pencil. And then I put a little bit of uh, water with a couple drops of dish detergent and then a couple drops of fish oil. So I think it was most likely from uh, tuna. It could have been from sardines, but just a little bit. And then you sink it in the ground so that the, the lid is at uh, ground level. And let me tell you something, and this is at the base of my roses, and I had three of them throughout my rose garden or throughout my plants, because my roses are intermingled with other plants. Uh, it wasn't too long before there were um, hundreds of disgusting earwigs in there. So I won. So I just want to share that with you. Good. Job. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I need I need more clarification on that. <laughs> I Okay, so, okay, so do you... <laughs> This could be world changing right now. Okay, so you, uh, where do the earwigs go? The earwigs go into that hole and they drop in because they're attracted to the fish oil. So it's still attached to the- Yeah, the top and the bottom, it, it's closed and I've sunk it in the ground. Oh, okay. So it's like, okay. it's, it's, you know, below the grade of the soil. Okay. And then, but the lid is at the surface of the soil. So they come and they crawl over and they drop in. And then in a couple of days, you see hundreds of gross earwigs kind of cool. rotting in oil. It is really exciting. It's nice. a, I, there's an Instagram page on um, a post on my uh, Instagram page uh, from last August or September when I had it. And then I learned this trick because they were eating all my roses and I was really mad. That's awesome. It works and it's very inexpensive and it's on the UCIPM website. So there you go, cool. science-based. Non-toxic traps, that's what we're talking about. That's great. <laughs> um, all right, so traps and barriers are mechanical controls. And then we can talk about biological controls, which is again, understanding the ecosystem of the garden and that 90% of the bugs in the garden are actually good bugs. So we do want to encourage them. They are pollinators. So they're going to make our uh, roses nice bloom, bloom nice and beautifully. They are, um, are there are also uh, predators, uh, ladybugs and things that eat other pest insects like aphids. And then there's um, parasitic insects like parasitic wasps. That's what we want to focus on, but more diversity, the better. So beneficial bugs will eat our bugs. Um, and the way we want, what we wanna do is encourage them into our garden. Yes, we can buy them and release them. That is one way to add beneficials to our garden. Uh, we can't, they do fly, so we can't guarantee that they're gonna stick around, especially after they've eaten all those aphids or all those pest insects. So what we wanna do is we also wanna encourage them to encourage them into the garden and to stick around if we release them. And the way we can do that is by planting plants that they like that supply nectar for them because like ladybugs do eat aphids, but they also do like uh, nectar from plants as well. So beneficial in insects tend to like plants like daisies or sunflowers with that button in the middle and the ray of petals around or um, plants like yarrow um, have clusters of small flowers they, or ceanothus Plants like that um, will also attract a lot of beneficial insects. And of course, um, so the more diversity in the garden will invite more diversity of bugs, which will balance each other out. And then reducing pesticide usage will also help your beneficials. And um, we do wanna focus on proper identification because um, beneficials and pest insects can look very similar. We wanna understand if we're seeing damage on the plant, we wanna understand what it is. Is it a snail and slug, an earwig, or um, a rodent or a bird? They, lots of um, pests can cause similar damage, but they require different tactics. So we wanna identify the pest and we wanna understand the life cycle. Um, and then we're gonna understand the, the habitat and timing. We do know that aphids will come in the spring that it, and they like that new growth. So we do understand that they're gonna come. Maybe we can tolerate some of them and we know how to 
deal with them when they do arrive. Um, and then of course, we wanna make sure there's natural enemies present um, as we discussed on the pr previous page. This is one of my favorites because uh, if we're not able to properly identify the um, insect that we're seeing, we are really in the, um, we're kind of prone to just be very reactive and just kill. And I will share it from personal experience that that's what I have done in the past. However, um, hoverflies or surfid flies, which are small little flies that look like a wasp or a bee, are one of our most important beneficial insects in the garden. And their larva, though they're, they're a pollinator, but the larva is going to feast on aphids and other small insects like uh, white fly nymphs and thrips, and, uh, but their favorite is the aphids. And they can be very, very tiny and they can grow as large as um, about a third of an inch. And they're going to be the only kind of worm-like critter on our roses that has this racing stripe down their back. A lot of times they're either going to be lime green to kind of a khaki brown. And if you go out at dusk, I, well, I like to go out at dusk to do a little surfid fly larva hunting because it's pretty fun. They're usually very active around dusk and you can see them on there around aphids and they're just gonna all of a sudden just go ping and eat an aphid. However, it sure looks like a rose slug or anything else. And sometimes I have been accidentally just wiped them off with my thumb because I'm wiping off aphids. But I guess what I'd like to share is that take a minute to look and observe a little closer. And if when in doubt, hold back, take a picture, send it to one of us, find out what it is. Um, because if this is a beneficial insect, you don't need to use any pesticides. And I can also share having a different tolerance for some aphids, like Charlotte just mentioned, have some aphids out there because when we have aphids and it's food for our beneficial insects, if we don't have any food for them, they're not gonna stick around. So working with eco-friendly pesticides, what I'd like to share is that Pesticides don't necessarily solve the pest problem. We really wanna understand what the pest problem is and address that problem. Because if we're going for the pesticide first and we haven't addressed the problem, the problem is not going away and we're gonna to have to use that pesticide again. So just understand that uh, we our first mode of action is usually everything else we've mentioned in the program so far. And then um, something I'd like to share is when we have insects in the garden that we think are a pest, we wanna understand um, how, how they're operating. Because when we can understand how they're operating, then we can choose a product that's going to be best suited for the type of insect it is. So I've broken it into three categories, insects with sucking or rasping mouth parts. Um, this would include thrips, uh, aphids, aphids, white fly nymphs. I'm sure there's a lot more that, uh, but I'm blanking. Uh, insects with chewing mouth parts, which would include uh, like um, rose saw fly or rose slug, uh, slugs and snails have chewing mouth parts, earwigs have chewing mouth parts, um, caterpillars, things like that. And then crawling insects. Crawling insects um, are going to be moving across things. So when we know how the insects kind of function, then we could tackle them with a little bit more ease. Whereas uh, if, uh, insects with the sucking uh, rasping mouth parts, we can wipe them off, we can syringe them or blast them with water. We invite beneficial insects. We avoid those synthetic fertilizers because they're attracted to all the sugars and that new flush of growth. We increase the circulation of the plants just so that, uh, for instance, uh, spider mites and um, white flies have a tendency to really like the poor circulation or those really closed environments. 
So we want to open that up and then we want to always check on the irrigation because a lot of times we're overwatering or if those plants really aren't drying out, like remember we said, we got to check the top couple inches. We want to make sure that we're letting those plants dry out some because a lot of times overwatering is stressing plants out and it's attracting some of these insects. But then we can always go for insecticidal soaps and oils. Chewing insects with chewing mouth parts. We're gonna remove by hand, maybe knock them into a bucket of water. We can work with barriers and traps. We can, um, a lot of times these chewing insects like beetles and weevils, the larval stage is going to be in the ground. So if we apply beneficial nematodes to the soil around that plant, they're going to then eat the larval stage. Uh, BT, which is a biopesticide and beneficial bacteria, spinosad also, they need to be ingested. These are pesticides that have to be ingested for them to work. Uh, so would not work in the first category, uh, would not work with those um, insects. The rasping mouth parts, but not the sucking mouth parts. And then iron phosphate is a snail bait. But then crawling insects, uh, I know snails also crawl, so we can use iron phosphate as a control for snails, but we wanna remove them by hand work with barriers and traps, and then diatomaceous earth, uh, crawling insects get on their exoskeleton and it dehydrates them. So when we work with pesticides, we wanna understand how they work and always read the label to apply them according to the label. So insecticidal soap, excellent for those insects with those sucking mouth parts or rasping mouth parts. Soft-bodied insects only, no, not insects that have a hard shell like a beetle. It's potassium salts and fatty acids is the active ingredient. It's a very narrow spectrum. That means it only has a very a short list of insects that it, um, it kills. And it's probably one of the least toxic products that we could use. This is not dish detergent and water, okay? This is not a do-it-yourself homemade remedy. This is something that we're buying. It's potassium salts of fatty acids. Um, then we have neem. Neem is very popular, especially with us that have roses. It is a clarified hydrophobic extract of neem oil, which comes from the nut of the neem tree. It is very broad spectrum. It kills a lot of insects as well as fungal diseases and mites. So if we have aphids and we have ladybugs, the ladybugs will not be killed by the neem oil, but the ladybug larva will, okay? So we really wanna be careful. Uh, and if you are just using um, the neem as a fungal control, black spot and rust, please use just a fungicide because if we've got beneficial insects present, probably the reason why you don't see aphids, then we're gonna kill them. And then spinosad, very popular. Um, it is a, uh, it disrupts the insects. Uh, it's a neurotransmission disruptor. It's very broad spectrum. It does not uh, kill insects with, um, uh, it only kills insects with chewing and rasping mouth parts, not sucking mouth parts. I know this might be getting a little technical, but this is important. So very good for managing thrips. Uh, for instance, or any of those other insects that have chewing mouth parts like the rose slug. However, we're limited to only using it six times a year. So with that, there's other things that we might want to use that could be better. And we absolutely want to avoid any pro products that contain neonicotinoids. These are the neonics. Um, these are products that are typically uh, applied around the root zone as a soil drench or they're sprayed on. They work as a systemic moving through every cell of that plant, including the root zone. So it means it's going through the pollen and the nectar. So any pollinators visiting this plant, they're gonna get killed. Uh, the root zone, okay, spreads out, might be weaving into other plants that we didn't intend to apply this pesticide to. Let's say our sunflowers or uh, anything else that might maybe wildflowers in the field behind our garden. Well, guess what? Now those plants are absorbing this pesticide through the root zones that are interwoven. So this is not only a water quality issue, a uh, pesticide that does contaminate our waterways, but this is a, a huge um, risk for any of our beneficials and pollinators. So please avoid this product. 
when we use pesticides, we always use them as a, a last resort when we've exhausted all the other options. We're always going to choose eco-friendly and less toxic so we cannot uh, pollute our waterways. Uh, we're going to use less toxic products, but understand they might take a little longer. So with the example of neem, it could take about four days before insects are killed. So we want to understand that mode of action and know what to expect so we're not disappointed because more is not better. We just want to let the products uh, work, but we it, it's complicated and there's a lot of science to understand. So that's what we're trying to share. So be patient. We're going to apply the pesticides always to uh, according to the label. We wanna understand the unintended consequences of our actions. And we do wanna take advantage of the dormant season care. So if we have a lot of uh, an unusual amount of aphids or black spot or rust during the season, once we have the dormant season, then maybe take advantage of spraying a dormant application of a, a fungicide like copper or an oil like insect, um, like horticultural oil, so we can reduce the diseases and insects in the coming year. We also want to know that pest and only target that pest. We're not spraying down the whole garden. We're going to apply at sundown, but as I shared, some beneficial insects are still active at sundown. So just be really careful. Uh, we're going to apply, um, we're going to always avoid spraying or applying any pesticides to plants when they're in bloom. And we wanna wear PPE when we're handling pesticides, even eco-friendlies, because I've known people to have dermal reactions to neem and insecticidal soap. Uh, our skin is very sensitive. We wanna protect our eyes and our lungs. And then if we're releasing beneficial insects, give them some time to find the pest before we apply pesticides. Excellent. So now we understand some basic IPM practices in the garden, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about specific pests of roses and management strategies. So we've talked about aphids a lot. Uh, they, are, they do come out in the spring when the weather gets uh, warmer and there's new growth in plants. They do like that new fresh growth. So we should expect aphids. Um, other things that do promote or invite aphids is using synthetic fertilizers because it, synthetic fertilizers do act like a steroid. And they help plants push new, lots more new growth. Um, pruning also does promote new growth as well. So we wanna just um, prune for, you know, prune for uh, removing damaged and diseased branches, but not over pruning. Um, if you see ants crawling on your plants, that, are, that could be an indicator that you have aphids. Uh, ants do like to farm the, the secretions, the honeydew that aphids leave behind. So if you do see a, a ants crawling up the plant, that is a good idea, good um, sign to look closer and look for your aphids. And keeping your ants away from the plant will help give access to the aphids for beneficial insects. So ants actually fight off beneficial insects like ladybugs. Um, so if you reduce the ant population, you'll leave the aphids more vulnerable to the beneficial insects. And again, the, white, uh, the, uh, the predators will, increasing the predators like uh, ladybugs and other beneficials will help keep that population down. Uh, white flies also very common. Um, they are often a sign of overwatering um, and poor, or poor drainage. So if you see that, make sure that your soil has some good drainage um, or maybe reduce watering. And they can also increase when feeding with synthetic fertilizers. They do like that fresh new growth. And um, Western flower thrips uh, also can be in invited by poor irrigation, so too much or too little. So again, we're gonna check our, our um, soil before we water again. Um, also feeding with synthetic fertilizers will push that new growth and all three aphids, white fly and thrips are very susceptible to beneficial insects. There's a lot of pests or insects out there that do eat them. So we do wanna increase that um, the, the diversity and beneficials in our garden to reduce those pest problems. 
And then spider mites also, um, they, as Suzanne mentioned already, they do like poor air circulation and kind of dry, dusty conditions. So if we prune the plants to open up a little bit more and allow for more air circulation, we will reduce our spider mite populations, avoiding those synthetic fertilizers and using broad spectrum pesticides too often can also um, invite spider mites, likely killing off their enemies. Yeah, the thing with the spider mites, it's really funny, is that they have, it, they almost know when they're under threat. So when we use a pesticide, it triggers them to reproduce very quickly. So what we find is when we are using pesticides to combat spider mites, oftentimes we've killed off the natural enemies and we've also exasperated the problem. So... Okay, rose slugs or sawflies, very common. Um, we're gonna look a little closer, we're gonna monitor, and the minute we start to see them, I just go out and smash them. If you're grossed out by smashing them, put your gloves on and smash them. If you're grossed out by smashing with your gloves on, then maybe get two like um, pieces of uh, something like a towel or something to smash them, but that's the best way to manage them. You can use products um, because they are eating. You can use products like spinosad, but what I found is that works even better is um, a product that has uh, the, py the natural pyrethrins with oil uh, under the brand name of Takedown as well as other brands. Um, this is just it kills them immediately and it break that pesticide breaks down very quickly. So it doesn't cause a threat to our environment. However, I don't use pesticides. So I just monitor and I make sure that I really um, nip these guys in the bud the minute I see them. And then uh, beetles, weevils, any of these, you know, um, cucumber beetles also, they uh, really will wreak some havoc on the roses. And again, monitoring. And the minute I see them, I go out uh, late, uh, right before sundown with my little bucket of like soapy water and I just knock them in because a lot of times they have this uh, default just to drop when they see a predator such as myself coming. So if I have the soapy bucket of water underneath and I just knock the bud of that plant, they just fall right in. We can also apply the beneficial nematodes to the drip line of the plants to combat any of the larval stages of these uh, insects. And then black spot and rust. So uh, already seen a couple comments about this. So as I shared, some roses are just prone to it. Okay. So have a different kind of level of tolerance. I'd like to invite you to just know some roses are really just magnets for rust. It gets really gross, it also at black spot. But I can share, if you defoliate, remove the leaves on the bottom third of that plant, open it up. And then please use a, a eco-friendly fungicide. Go for a sulfur-based fungicide or um, copper soap fungicide. Use these products. However, we wanna make sure we're not spraying during the heat of the day. And we wanna make sure we're spraying uh, both sides of the leaves, okay? But if that rose is prone to black spot and rust, these um, actinovate also is a really great one. That's a beneficial bacteria. These uh, products are not going to necessarily solve the problem. It's just gonna temporarily leave some ease. So it's not going to necessarily spread so much. Absolutely avoid overhead watering. We're going to only water during the early, early mornings because, again, that moisture is going to exasperate these problems. Whereas powdery mildew, it's quite the opposite. Powdery mildew starts to bloom when the temperatures are warm and dry, and uh, they can these spores can spread with the wind, so they can be coming in from the neighbors. But they also can be lingering from last year. That's another reason why it's so important to clean up the garden, pick the leaves up, get them off site. Uh, we can blast the leaves of powdery mildew off with water, but we also want to make sure we've, we're syringing the back of that leaf because the powdery mildew does go through the front to the back. And uh, we can also remove those leaves, again, defoliate, make sure we have a little bit of airflow at the bottom. And if we are watering, we're going to water early in the day, or if we're syringing those plants, we're going to rinse them off in the early part of the day. So all those water droplets can dry before the end of the day. And then be really mindful to avoid herbicides. 
So herbicides, um, when our roses are dormant, we're not thinking, um, maybe we're using some of those products like glyphosate or um, 2,4-D or any of these uh, weed uh, killers that are so common right now, because we just had some rain, so now we've got a lot of weeds. But if there's a little bit of a breeze, those herbicides can drift and contact, make contact with our plants. Our roses are dormant, we're not even thinking about it, but when they break dormancy and we see this, it's not a disease, it was from uh, using an herbicide. And more resources, I know they're also on your resource page that got emailed out, but please uh, do a little research. Uh, go to the UCIPM website, look at all of the different types of pests that um, pests and diseases that roses are prone to They'll offer you a lot of support. Absolutely check out um, our website for some more help with growing beautiful roses. Understand how active ingredients work at the National Pesticide Information Center. It'll help you understand the mode of action. And then of course, learning more about eco-friendlies at the Armory Organic Materials Review Institute website. And let's finish with your questions. That was a lot. So I wanna make sure, I think I covered everyone's question in the q and A. I I wanna just continue briefly about gophers and voles. Uh, sounds like you don't have your roses in gopher baskets. So a good thing to do, though it's very time consuming is during the dormant season. So if they haven't broken dormancy yet, you can dig them up, put them in gopher baskets or get make gopher baskets out of uh, half inch hardware cloth, not always easy, um, or wait till next year to uh, dig them up when they're in their dormant period. Uh, in the meantime, you can work with gopher traps. Um, uh, vole traps would be little tiny mouse traps, like those Victor mouse traps that you could put right in front of the vole hole. Um, where they're coming in and out of their tunnel. You don't have to bait it. But either way, um, if working at traps is not so desirable and a little squeamish about it, uh, you can also work with their pellets. So there's products that are castor oil based. And when we saturate the soil with castor oil, sometimes we have to do it a couple of times to get really good saturation. The critters will avoid that area because they do not like getting that castor oil on the fur of their face. So those are some tips I can share. But hopefully I've covered all the other questions. But um, other than that, let's see what other questions might come up. I had to stop looking at the chat in the Q&A because that's what was advancing the screen. I'm so sorry. So it's not always good for me. but. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Yeah, I just, I wanted to say, cause this is important and I'm just now texting with the president of SLOW. And so if you are concerned about neonicotinoids because, you know, it is kind of a big deal. We do, um, we do buy from several vendors that don't use it. And I'm just gonna read off just so you have it, just cause it's kind of valuable information. So there, there's several vendors that are not using them at all. And so when you're at Slow, you can look for those specific vendors. We also have them, they should be labeled on our tables as neonicotinoid nicotinoid free. Mm -hmm. um, but the companies are Annie's Annuals, Bloom's Nursery, Cow Color Growers, Flatland Flower Farm, John's Nursery, Kawahara Nursery, Sebastopol Growers, SoCal Nursery Growers, Suncrest Nurseries, and Upstarts Organic Seedlings. So, and if you email me, I can email you all of that info too, but I appreciate that question. Um, I think Piper asked that. Yeah, so I, just, I appreciate I wanted to it dir too. I directly address that basically. And so, uh, and some uh, growers will, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, Jen, Jen is covering it. It's excellent. Thank <laughs> you for asking that question. Yeah, and I also wanted to say that um, even kind of like to, to Charlotte's point, how she doesn't have roses and we're not, or, you know, we won't let her forget that she said that at the Rose Organic Rose Care Center. But to her point, everything that they're talking about is principles that you want to apply across the board in your garden. So she can barely, very easily talk about this because this, the whole point of these classes is 
to really encourage that this, this is like a whole system we're talking about. It's not just specific to like certain things. We wanna think about the soil. We wanna think about the water. We wanna think about the fertilizer, like what we're spraying and all of this um, because it's, it's highly into, integrated. And so um, I, hope, I hope you all can like see the value in that for sure. And then one more thing, and then I know Suzanne and Charlotte have to say, but I, when I was thinking about when Charlotte was saying about keeping the mulch away from the crown of the plant, another thing to remember is to make sure that the plant is not planted too deep because mm -hmm. that, can also, um, that can also facilitate a lot of uh, fungus and whatnot. And so when in doubt, plant it a little high um it's yeah. better yeah you like yeah plant it especially like all all the beginner gardeners this is really good information because it's better to to plant it a little bit higher than a little bit lower i think sometimes we think well maybe that's a water reservoir or something no it it, it will um trap a lot of moisture and whatnot so anyway Yes. Just wanted to say those things. Yes, yeah. yes, and yes. And please don't hesitate to continue to ask Jen questions. You can mm -hmm. email her, but then Charlotte and I are also available to receive any questions. Have a look at our Instagram pages. You can see more of my roses there. And yeah, um, I just want to thank everyone so much. Uh, I really hope that we got everyone's question. There's and one, there was one I was just going to type an answer to, but I'll say it out loud. Okay. Um, someone's asking about adding compost to the soil. And compost is my favorite subject, so I have to answer this question. Um, when you're adding compost to uh, existing plants, uh, you can do it a few ways. You can either layer, put a nice layer of compost, like um, a half inch or so on top of the soil, and then just water it in, or even put mulch on top and let it, um, it'll work itself into the soil, or you can dig it into the soil, um, but don't go too deep. You don't want to disrupt so much of the soil, maybe just the top one or two inches. And then watering, watering again will also help uh, get those nutrients down into the soil deeper. Yeah, and I do want to remind everyone that we've definitely taken deeper dives on various subjects like com composting, soil health, fertilizer, uh, spraying. So check out uh, Sloat's website for the recordings. Also our YouTube channel has that all on it, on it. This is being recorded now and this recording will be available this Friday. I think that's the fourth. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, channel, you'll get a notification when the recording's up. Um, it, it'll be on our website too, under um, learn and then videos. And I forgot to mention that they did do an outline for this class and the, the outline will be available underneath the recording as well on our website. So anyway, this has been super informative and fun as always. I love having you both here. Um, I think that we've got a lot of good questions. I'm happy to see the interest people have in um, organic gardening just in general so I think and growing really cool. roses and growing roses you can grow yeah. a rose yeah for sure yeah. I'm actually just like a little side note Suzanne and I were talking I'm trans I'm putting a ton of native plants in my garden now I'm transitioning it into this biodiversity habitat and I'm keeping some roses in there so I'm planting native plants around my I, I I had 25 roses, I'm down to about 10, but I'm keeping some in. And so just to tell you, you can keep a rose here and there, you yeah. know, and have native plants and have drought tolerant plants well, and stuff like that. Yeah. Native pollinators like the roses too, especially mm -hmm. when they're open. Those yeah. beautiful stamens are showing. So well, and it's more of a, an ecosystem, like to your point of everything you're saying, you're 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 attracting things that are going to eat the bugs the bad bugs and attracting good bugs and whatever so anyway we love roses we sure do no, nothing like a rose <laughs> um, hey, thank, you, right. always, yeah, thank you jen always always a pleasure always a lot of fun thank you everyone we really appreciate it thank you all right have a wonderful wednesday evening thank you thanks everyone